so happy to have our special guest with us, uh, Dr. Lawrence Haddad, who is no stranger to the industry of and the landscape of food and nutrition across the world. Uh, we're so excited that he's joined us this morning. He won the 2019 World Food Prize, um, amongst others, and he currently serves as the leader of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which is driving nutrition, landscape policy transformation, implementation support across the world. We're also delighted to have Monica, who is a dynamic entrepreneur and business leader based in Zambia. She's the CEO and founder of Java Foods. She sits on many, many distinguished boards and is a leader in the scaling of nutrition movement. Uh, we're so delighted to have Monica. And I believe Taz is joining us shortly. Um, I don't know if he has, but Taz is a leader in Malawi um, and obviously a global leader. Um, and he currently sits at the helm of uh, the Malawi agency focused on agriculture and private sector investment. So we're delighted to have such a distinguished group with us today, and uh, we're expecting more panelists, uh, more participants to join us as we proceed. My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli. I'm the managing partner of Sahel Consulting and also the chair of Nourishing Africa. Uh, this forum is actually convened by Cot Catalyst 2030. Catalyst is a movement that was started by some very distinguished uh, social entrepreneurs from across the world, and it's a partnership between a range of organizations, including Echoing Green, Ashoka, and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, really focused on how social entrepreneurs can transform the landscape and ensure that we achieve the SDGs by 2030. Um, I am so excited to see wonderful participants uh, from across Africa and I know it's quite early in the morning and so we're really delighted that many of you joined us. I'm gonna give a quick introduction to Nourishing Africa so that we're all on the same page about Nourishing Africa. And then from there, we will actually dive into um, Sorry, let me just get the right presentation. We have a few Catalyst 20 events today. Um, so just bear with me. If, if you wouldn't mind sharing the screen and then just walking through the presentation and I'll, I'll uh, provide the presentation. Okay. Okay, I've actually found it, no worries. Apologies again for the delay. Okay, I hope everyone can see the screen. So Nourishing Africa was established because of the realization that Africa is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. Across the board, when you think about the African continent, this is one sector that we should be able to capitalize upon, leverage to enable us to feed our people and feed the world. And SMEs are the drivers of growth in this sector, not only the drivers of innovation, but they also handle about 80% of the food that's consumed on the continent. However, SMEs face a range of challenges. And from our research, uh, we identified many challenges and we prioritized these ones listed here. Lack of funding, poor linkages to markets, difficulty finding talent, or Talents. or facing serious viability concerns. COVID-19 has called for an urgent response. 
for us to really think about data and access to information, knowledge tools, financing and ecosystem support. Clearly, this is an opportunity for Africa to reimagine and rebuild already fragile ecosystems. So Nourishing Africa is a home for a million entrepreneurs. That's our vision. It's a hub, an online hub that provides a membership portal, knowledge and capacity building support, a jobs portal, events, food culture. But the vision is really to enable our entrepreneurs to connect with each other, to celebrate each other, but also to collectively scale, leveraging the knowledge, the tools, the resources, the technology, and the funding support that the hub can provide. To date, we have over 400 entrepreneurs on our hub, and some are very, very active, and that's really exciting, from across the African continent. The hub already has a lot of funding and capacity building support, it showcases tech innovations that you can leverage as an entrepreneur, as well as events. There's a lot of data because data is one of the huge challenges we identified. Data on every single value chain and activities within the value chain, opportunities within the value chain. We also have a lot of e-learning support that we've offered in partnership with a lot of organizations. We've also developed our own knowledge through podcasts and a lot of recordings, interviews, etc. And the webinars that we've recorded and the podcasts we recorded are available for free. We've interviewed entrepreneurs and experts from across the continent on key issues around branding, marketing, financing, food processing, access to information on vegetables and key value chains. Our food culture celebrates Africa food, African food. We believe that African food Zambian food, Malawian food, Nigerian food should be synonymous with excellence and healthy nutrition. And the way that the Japanese have been able to build their food ecosystem, we can do the same. Today, Japanese food is ranked number one in the world. We have so much to offer the world and we want to educate ourselves, but also to amplify the voices of our chefs and cooks. We also have a portal for jobs because we know a lot of our entrepreneurs are struggling to find talent and there are folks interested in the sector who also are looking um, to engage. As I mentioned, we have a membership portal which showcases funding opportunities, a marketplace for entrepreneurs to interface with each other, potential customers and suppliers. We ultimately will be providing agricultural discounts for inputs and services, um, training programs, uh, resources, and we're already showcasing a lot of entrepreneurs, getting them media publicity, linking them with funders, and providing talent matchmaking. We've had quite a few offline engagements in Morocco, South Africa, Kenya, really to build momentum and recruit entrepreneurs. And we have created a COVID-19 support structure for entrepreneurs on the hub. We've had a range of webinars and during COVID-19, we started an initiative called Ask an Expert, which has really taken off where entrepreneurs have the opportunity to ask experts in financing, food safety, food technology, and uh, strategy, what they should do, how they should do it. And it's really been a phenomenal experience. We've, we're launching something called First Thursday. Some of you have heard of First Fridays, a networking opportunity for entrepreneurs. And this one is really going to be online for many of you to meet each other one-on-one, -on -one, to solve problems together, to find ecosystem supporters and champions and networks um, and destiny helpers who can really help you navigate, but we'll also be sharing key information and support. And we believe that this is going to really take off because so many of our entrepreneurs feel isolated and really need support from each other. And then we're launching a COVID entrepreneurs recovery program where we're gonna be offering a diagnostic a resilience tool, um, a seminar online course, um, small grants for scalable SMEs, and we're going to be measuring the impacts and providing ongoing support. And we're doing this in partnership with a few international funders. So we're really excited to, and we hope to launch this in the next few weeks. So please watch the space. Um, and our partners include Sahel Consulting. So Nourishing Africa is actually being spun off into its own separate entity, uh, being led by two very capable women, uh, Ifi and Ramat, who some of you have interfaced with. We have a partnership with the Food and Land Coalition, the Enterprise Development Center at the Pan-Atlantic University, IBAN, who many of you know is funded by GIZ and UNDP, focused on inclusive business, and we look forward to expanding this partnership to many, many more.
uh, organizations over time. So that's really an introduction to Nourishing Africa. And we felt it was really important to share this so that many of you who are on here can invite others to join this hub and strengthen um, the knowledge and awareness more broadly about the hub. So at this time, I'm basically going to um, stop sharing the screen and we're going to invite Lawrence Haddad to please give us um, an introduction to some of the insights he has gotten in his role. Um, as I mentioned, for those who have just joined us, we're so excited to have Dr. Lawrence Haddad because the Glo Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition and the Scaling Up um, Nutrition uh, Network have been at the forefront of supporting SMEs prior to COVID, but during COVID. And they've actually done extensive research on how these entrepreneurs can survive and scale. Um, and I'll let him provide a few insights uh, from his work and from his understanding of the topic today, which is around innovation and policy. So Lawrence, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ndidi. It's great to be here. Thank you, Catalyst 2030. Um, Nourishing Africa looks um, amazing. Congratulations. Um, um, I'm humbled to be on the same panel as Ndidi, Monica, and Taz. So thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen and share with you a few slides of some of the intelligence we've been uh, receiving about what's happening with SMEs in, in Africa in the COVID-19 uh, period. So just bear with me while I share the screen. And I hope you can see that. Hold on. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so here's some, here's some um, data that is quite new. It's about three or four weeks old. I wanted to share it with you. It's a survey we did uh, along with, uh, with, with the Sun Business Network did this um, survey. Again, and the World Food Program are the co-conveners of the Sun Business Network. And Monica is one of the uh, ambassadors for the Sun Business Network, so she knows it very well. And we, we did a survey that said, uh, we, we, uh, Sun Business Network has about uh, 800 SMEs that are partners in about 20 countries, uh, mostly in Africa, but not all in Africa. And uh, we got responses from about half of those SMEs to an online survey, and I thought I would just share them with you. So first of all, as you could expect, the, the main impacts of COVID-19 uh, and the severity of the impacts, if you look at the pie chart on the right, you know, the yellow and the, the, yellow and the red are, mean that the, there are considerable severe risks uh, from an impacts of COVID-19. So more than half of the 342 SMEs that responded said, this is, this is a big deal for us. I mean, everyone said it's, a, it's something to manage, but uh, over 50% over, over said uh, this is a big deal for us. And, and some of the impacts reported are on the left. And again, uh, those of you who are, who are in the industry, in the business, run SMEs, work with SMEs, this shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Uh, sales declining, difficulty accessing inputs, especially across borders, but even within countries, limited financial reserves and liquidity. So, you know, significant numbers, significant impacts. The, um, one of the big things that comes up is financing. Um, bigger companies can ride out the, the effects of the lockdown. Smaller companies, of course, can't. They need uh, 80, uh, nearly 80 percent of the firms responding, the 296 firms responding to this question said, we need financing for working capital. We can't bridge any, any short, any period where we don't have uh, money coming through the door. The types of financing they wanted on the left-hand side of the slide, they don't want grants, they want loans. Uh, they want the, the green stuff, the, but they don't want, I mean, the short-term stuff is good, the yellow, but they really want long-term loans, which, which really, really says something to, uh, about the, the pre-COVID state of affairs. Pre-COVID, they weren't having access to short, uh, to, to medium and long-run loans. And that has only exacerbated in the COVID period. We did an, al an analysis of impact investing um, uh, earlier, well, last year. We published it uh, last year. And in fact, these, these numbers from the Global Impact Investing Report from 2019. 
And you know, impact investing, which is you invest uh, either loans or equity investments, and you expect a business return, but also a social return. That's a two hundred billion dollar industry. Um, we uh, we looked using the numbers in the global impact investing report. We said how much of that two hundred billion goes to food and agriculture, wherever it is in the world. That's about eighteen billion. Of that eighteen billion, how much in food and agriculture? How much goes to Africa? About five billion. And then of that food and ag in Africa, that five billion, how much goes to nutritious foods? And I'm not not talking about cocoa and and cacao and coffee. I'm talking about fruits, vegetables, eggs, dairy, meat, fish for domestic consumption. And we estimate it's about 200 million. So 200 million uh, doesn't go very far when you're dividing, when you're allocating that to 54 countries in Africa. And Didi talked about a million entrepreneurs. It doesn't go very far uh, when you're looking about a, at a million entrepreneurs. So there's clearly a need to in- expand that nutritious food financing space in sub-Saharan Africa or in Africa writ large uh, to smaller medium enterprises. And this is something GAIN is doing. We're launching a, a nutritious food financing facility, which will add 60 million to that 200 million in Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Tanzania, and Mozambique. But this is just a, a pilot, if you like. What we really want to do is show the existing uh, food and ag funds in Africa, those 5 billion. We want to show those 5 billion that they can also open a nutritious food financing window, that it, that it actually can be commercially sustainable as well as nutritionally impactful. And one of the things that we would, I'd like to, to talk to Nourishing Africa about and, and, and other partners is we want to form a nutritious food financing alliance that we can um, launch in uh, the Nutrition for Growth Summit in Japan. Indeed, you mentioned Japan. We want to launch this alliance, which, which is a group of partners that are committed to expanding impact investing uh, opportunities for SMEs in Africa that will advance nutrition. So uh, that's, that's one area for action that we could perhaps talk a bit about. Some of the needs are, are big, big TA needs. Um, and again, it's not all about finance. It's about um, marketing advice, advice on sales distribution, business resilience planning, development of online platforms. These are all really, really important. And indeed, he has spoken about these eloquently at, at previous uh, sessions that I've been at. The SMEs have big expectations of government. Governments, they think, and they're right to think, can help a lot. Financial support, yes, but also incentives. Really, really important. And I want to talk about the incentives now. This is another piece of work that GAIN and the Sun Business Network are doing. It's called EBANI. And it's trying to measure how seriously are governments trying to do two things. How seriously are governments, what what are their aspirations for nutrition? Uh, And what what are they doing to support businesses? to achieve and help them achieve those aspirations. And we've done this analysis with Third Way Africa, and we've classified uh, Sun Business Network countries into low, medium, high aspirations, that how, how, how seriously are their governments taking nutrition, and, and also low, medium, high, what policy incentives are there for businesses to do more nutrition? And so the aspirations has 16 indicators, the policy incentives for business has 10 indicators. These are data that already exist. We're not collecting them, we're just assembling them. And what you really want to get to is that green square, high aspirations, high incentives for business to help meet those aspirations. And this is where three uh, countries, I just picked three to illustrate three different cases. Nigeria is in the high aspiration. The government is saying the right things and is put in place the right policies, whether there are Uh, enforcing and enacting and implementing those policies is another question, but at least the aspirations are there. The policy incentives of business are are medium. There are some countries that are quite a bit higher than Nigeria and some that are quite a bit lower. So the challenge for the government here is to uh, incentivize business to help the government achieve its high aspirations. Zambia is in uh, low incentives for business but medium aspirations for government. So again, the, their challenge is to increase the aspirations and increase the incentives. And Lesotho is um, surprisingly actually high on the policy incentives, but low on the aspirations. So again, this is just one example of how to use data to begin conversations 
that should lead to action from, from government. Uh, so conclusions, SMEs, we know they're the backbone of local food systems in Africa. They've been hit hard by COVID-19. They need TA and finance. They find it hard to get finance, and those impact investing numbers are, are shocking, I think. In the nutritious food financing space, they have been bypassed by impact investing. Less than 0.1% of the total impacting investment sector goes to Africa and nutritious foods. Less than 0.1%. Less than $1 in a thousand goes to Africa, nutritious food financing. And SMEs can be incentivized by governments that are determined to transform their food, transform their food systems. So thank you, Ndidi. Thank you, Lawrence. That was a fantastic presentation, very insightful. And I appreciate the pioneering work that GAIN is doing. Uh, those numbers are staggering um, and uh, really alarming from where we sit. Um, and I think we're very committed to working with you and other stakeholders to transform this landscape. And indeed, um, so please, do, please do share the slides with all the participants. Thank you, we definitely will do so. Yesterday, uh, somebody posted, who's a very respected entrepreneur across Africa, Mark Essien on Twitter, I don't know how many of you saw that, saying, why is, why is Africa wasting its time on agriculture? We know that many other countries have discarded the focus on this sector. It's a waste of time and resources. So Monica, I'll start with you. <laughs> How would you respond to that type of comment for somebody like Mark Essien, Hotels.Africa, Hotels.NG, award-winning entrepreneur? How would you respond to that? I'm surprised at the comment, first of all, because I think the question is, what will we eat? And I think COVID is actually highlighted the, the seriousness of why we need to get um, the food systems working better and actually really uh, prop up local, local uh, food systems uh, much more. I think um, obviously the, the food systems and agricultural systems have, have a lot of flaws, country to, depending on the country. I mean, right now, Southern Africa is coming out of another year or, of drought, although this year seems to be much better. East Africa is just fighting locust. Then we have COVID. Uh, and you can imagine what for Africa this means. And also Africa remains a net importer of a lot of food. So this year has been actually quite a chilling uh, realization for us about we really need to get, start really focusing on getting local food systems right. Um, and you can imagine, I think um, in April when people woke up to the cost of food and people thinking, what were we going to eat when the borders closed? A lot of countries, a lot of people were faced with uh, questions about how food was going to move because there was unilateral closing of borders. And a lot of uh, producers such as myself were thinking about how we we're going to get raw materials into the country to produce food. So now, if we are going to completely discard it and think other people will make food for us, we're going to have a problem. We have a lot of competitive advantages. I think we do need um, support. I think uh, Lawrence's uh, presentation and the data that has been produced is very helpful. It is not new, but I really hope that with COVID, it's really um, making people sit up. I can speak for Zambia, I think as a landlocked country, I think government was really quite concerned about uh, food security and nutrition and immediately began to engage local producers and really ask the question to say, what is it that's really going to change things? And it's not a quick fix solution. I mean, um, we are all at different um, stages as SMEs, but there's, and this is very important for everyone who's listening, that SMEs play a very fundamental role in food systems and we need to support them critically and we need to actually all work together to move forward on it in order to 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 worry less about food security and also about nutrition thank you monica I, you have been at the forefront of championing these messages for since you started java foods um, and I know that we share a bit of a frustration around one step forward, two steps back on the continent. How can we as entrepreneurs leverage innovation and technology and shape policy to ensure that we really emerge from COVID-19 stronger than we started? So I think, I mean, coming from where I sit, I think there have been a lot of silos. I think uh, we as SMEs or entrepreneurs have really been just, you know, sort of getting on with our business and really not engaging with governments or with regul re regulators or those other stakeholders, you know, and there are a lot of stakeholders involved in food security and nutrition. And I think what this has shown us is that we want, if we do not talk, 
if we, we don't have data, uh, if we're not supported by data, so as I said, um, the, the work that you're doing as well as GAIN is doing is really important for us to be able to sit down and say, okay, this is the reality we're faced with. What can we do about it? Because we're also seeing a lot of efforts, by the way, from various stakeholders, but everyone is pulling in their own direction. So private, the, 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 the reality is that you need private sector to be involved in any, in any step we're going to take forward for food security. So therefore, we need to be uh, aware of what the challenges are. We also need to understand what, where people are putting funding, where um, the emphasis, they, you know, there's some things which have priority, others are not, and see how we can feed into that. So I think now uh, we should be using platforms like such as Nourishing Africa, uh, networks like um, Scaling Up Business Network as well, to speak with a, a singular voice and say, these are the things we need uh, in order for us to actually impact on, um, on in the agri uh, food space and really, really move the dial. I mean, I think I, I really love the gain, um, the presentation because of what it actually highlights. And, you know, the, we do need to do something about it. I think we need to now really say that um, every year we see this, what are we doing now? Because if we don't deal with these issues, a lot of the SMEs you're talking about will not be around in a few months. And to start them up again will take so much longer. And that means a lot of very expensive food for, for, for our people and make it much harder for us. So I really hope that these sorts of conversations yield a lot more um, aggressive thinking, um, a lot more platforms where we can engage much more and some action, some action. We really want to see action. And can you just delve into your own experience over the last three months? Um, we spoke before COVID-19, you were thriving, um, you know, and I'm sure there have been a few setbacks, but you're still thriving uh, in spite of it all. So just share yeah. some insights for how you have coped because the entrepreneurs on this uh, platform who, who want to learn from you and want to be inspired by your work. Sure. I think it's really important to say that I think uh, we're not unique. We've probably gone through all the same challenges, supply chain issues, really uh, concerns about the safety of our workers, um, how to reach our customers, uh, getting paid for supplies, um, and even dealing with banks uh, and getting financing. In the best of times, it's hard to speak with a banker for them to understand your business and your, and your financing needs. So in a crisis, it's, it's, been, it's, a, it's been a disaster. So that was really the first few weeks when we just were in a panic about what are we going to do? And there was a real, a real discussion about looking at finances, looking at our priorities, looking at, at what we could uh, deal with right away, looking at products we could actually push forward. And what has emerged from COVID is a real discussion about health, about nutrition, about really giving the consumer foods which are nutrient dense, and even in our messaging talking about this to say, you know, COVID is about, um, is attacking people with pre-existing um, diseases. And really what you want to do is be much more resilient, eat the right foods. And that's our messaging here in Zambia. And this is what we're also encouraging um, our, our, our partners and the government to talk about. And therefore actually um, uh, persuading the consumer now to spend their, their, their money differently and focus much more on nutritious foods. So Java has a number of products and we have managed to somewhat pivot. I mean, we have um, a leading instant noodle brand, which is great when schools are open, but schools have now been closed for three weeks. And therefore we have seen a, a, a drop in sales with that product. But what we have seen an increase in sales um, and a lot more discussion around is with our fortified cereals. Um, and uh, these are uh, fortified vital vit vitamins and minerals made from uh, locally grown soya and maize. And we are speaking to a lot of our partners or the NGOs about how to actually t get this to the most vulnerable. I mean, COVID has exposed, particularly in the urban areas, a lot of vulnerability because of the large informal sector. Remember, a lot of people are daily wage earners and therefore because they're not working, could not actually access food normally. So we've had, we've seen, for instance, the World Food Program come up with the social cash transfer system, which is really quite commendable. And now we're saying to them, okay, which areas are you focusing on? Where do people, which communities do these people stay? How can we make sure that the right foods are in those communities? How can we work with government to make sure distribution costs may, um, 
uh, that were able to distribute the food to where people need it. And most of them, um, in a way, the good thing is it's in the urban areas. So um, companies like Java, are very, we distribute very well in the urban areas, but it's more about coordinating with um, uh, groups like the World Food Program to say, where are you really focusing on? Let's make sure the right foods are there at, uh, and are affordable for people to actually access them. So we've actually seen, I mean, from the fear and the, from, you know, the first few weeks of what are we going to do? And also, you know, the fallacy, everyone says, oh, everybody, I mean, food, you'll do well. Of course you'll do well because everyone needs to eat. I wish it was so simple. Because, you know, to produce food in a safe environment, you really make, need to make sure you have your raw materials, you know, your, your plant is certified, etc. And the first few weeks, we were really concerned about, you know, food safety issues, about raw materials, about distribution. But I think very quickly, we were able to discuss with partners to really focus on what is needed by the consumer now. So we still have challenges. I mean, I think um, uh, people are still a little bit hazy about how to finance uh, businesses such as ourselves. Uh, cost of financing is still very high. Even accessing the financing is quite difficult. So you know, when, I, when you, we saw those figures about who, uh, how much money is available to um, uh, SMEs who uh, sell nutritious products, the fact is because they're so small, perhaps they're not actually investor ready. They're not able to access the, you know, uh, funding in traditional ways. So we really need technical support to make businesses actually uh, grow to be able to access larger amounts of financing because you know a lot of SMEs may get ten thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars it's not enough to scale a business to really have impact so we need a lot of technical support on that aspect we need technical support on formulation um, really trying to focus on what we locally produce to make good food safe food we need to also encourage um, you know, food safety and quality environments. I think uh, before or Africa is perhaps not as resilient. We need to really enforce that to make sure we have safe food as well. And I think this is what is coming out of this period and what we're really trying to encourage. So I think we have pivoted a bit. I mean, it's still very difficult, um, but it's possible. And I, I mean, I, 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 if you, when we spoke maybe two or three months ago, I think, as I said, there was panic. And now there's a lot, okay, how can we move forward? How can we really um, capitalize on the opportunities? How can we build and foster partnerships with others to get, you know, to create an opportunity? And I really, I'm really thankful for a lot of the stakeholders who we're speaking with because everyone is innovating and thinking about things now. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for that very passionate and clear message. It's tough, but it's doable. Um, somebody responded, to my, my comments about Mark Essien. Very interesting chats going on. And he says, I think Mark's comment explains how investors look at agriculture. He mentioned how it's cheaper to import food than to grow them in Africa, arguably, but has some truth. I think it's a challenge to make our food value chain more efficient um, and tell more success stories as things evolve. So clearly there is a, yeah. I was going to say that it's really cheaper because with it's with, look at all the devaluations of the African currencies with COVID, 25 to 30 percent. So when the food landed in on, on the supermarket, people panicked. It's so so expensive, but they are right to say that we have to be much more efficient because where we really we lose the value locally if we're not efficient, and that's where we need the support. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to come back to you, Lawrence, before we start taking the questions that are coming into the chat. One of the things that frustrates me um, to an nth degree is the fact that the food ecosystem is often placed squarely in the Ministry of Agriculture's purview when it has so much to do with trade and investment, with women and gender, with technology. And we have like seven ministries working almost in silos, often creating competing policies that negate what one policy is doing. In the Nigerian context, um, the central bank is so pivotal to agriculture right now and is also leading policy changes. Meanwhile, we have the Ministry of Trade and Investment. Um, in dairy, every single ministry is coming up with its own policy. So I'm just curious, how have you seen this issue addressed? Um, and what can we do proactively as entrepreneurs to shape an ecosystem that works for us, um, that's cohesive and collaborative, uh, where these policies are aligned. 
That, that's a really good question, uh, indeed. I'm going to give you a sort of a roundabout answer. If I'm going to go from big picture to small picture. So big picture, I was thinking about your question about Mark Essien. I, I, you know, I think change, change happens when three things happen. Um, there has to be a, a prob I, I like to think of it as three streams. There has to be a problem stream. So we clearly have a big problem stream right now. There's a, there's a problem. It's on everyone's mind. People are uh, feeling under pressure to do something about it, certainly in government. There's a, there's a political stream. Is there a political window? Is there someone in power who's determined to do something different for whatever reason? Let's work with it. Let's go with the flow. Let's find that person. And then there needs to be a solution stream. Uh, uh, we need to have a range of things. We need to have a range of businesses that are ready to go. They're investor ready. We need to have a range of examples of innovation, of success, of potential. We need to show uh, the people we're trying to convince how to do what they, whatever it is we want them to do. We need to make it easy for them. So, you know, I think when I think of the problem stream, I think data is really important. Um, when I think of the uh, political stream, I think engagement is really important. And when I think of the solution stream, I, I just think of, we need to, we need to communicate the stories really. When those three things come together, I think you have, you have something. And I think you dispel pictures that people like Mark Essien, he has a picture of African agriculture in his head. And I would argue that it's a picture from 1980. I don't know, I don't know him. Uh, so maybe I'm being really unfair. But I, a lot of people have this picture of 1980s agriculture in their head. They don't have the 2020 v version, which is dynamic leaders like uh, the, the people on this panel and the participants in the list. So we need to get rid of that picture. To, to pull together all the different ministries this Ibani tool I told you about covers lots of different ministries and GAIN works with Ministry of Industry more than it works with the Ministry of Trade, uh, of Agriculture, for sure. Uh, we work with ministries of industry, trade, finance, planning. These are the ministries that we work with because that's where you, you're forced to get uh, some convergence of, of the different issues. So I think uh, Ibani is a, is a good tool because it says, here are all the different things the government is doing across all the different ministries. And actually, some are helpful for business, but some are not. So it's a good tool, it's a good starting point. Some business networks are one of the few platforms I've seen at the national and subnational level that crowd in uh, SMEs from food-related sectors and SMEs from, um, and uh, ministries from uh, different, different parts of the government. So I think that's good. We need more of those kind of fora, but these fora are useful, but very often they sort of become an end in and of themselves. And that cannot be allowed to happen. There are means to an end and the end is, is action. Uh, so it, it requires collective voice. It requires a group of SMEs in, in Zambia, Monica, forgive me for just picking on Zambia, a group of SMEs in Zambia armed with evidence, armed with uh, examples of what their, the sector can do with a very specific ask of government to, to change this particular policy and a very clear idea that there is someone in government who might be willing to do that. So I think it's, I think it's quite, and that's, that's difficult to do when you're running a business. So we need to figure out ways of, of making it easy. Sorry, long answer. No, 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 I think you're, you're spot on. And, and you, you ended with a very important thing, which is how much, you know, Monica and I are probably sitting in the same yeah. space. And I'm sure many of the people on this platform we're being called to shape policy, to get involved in initiatives at the national level, um, which is exciting and important, but we also have businesses to run, <laughs> to set up, to ensure they're viable, ensure that they're success stories. And there's a thin line being, between being respected as an entrepreneur and being uh, recognized as an activist. Um, so Monica, how have you straddled those demands on your time? Um, I know it's still early days, but I'm just curious. And practic what practical advice would you give those listening who say, yes, we need infrastructure. I see all the comments coming in. We need infrastructure. We need financing. We need technology. Yeah, you want to shape policy, but you have a business to run. How do you straddle it? Sure. I think um, somehow um, raising some uh, financing for my business actually changed a lot for myself. Um, 
because you put into measure governance procedures and you really begin to focus and then you sit down and, and, and you focus you say okay what how much time can you devote to x y and z and actually your board or your mentors really help say to you i think you should you know 20 percent of your time should be focused on policy because the reality is as, as lawrence has said you do need champions. We do need in the sectors to show that we can win, we can have some wins, because it's very, very difficult, for, particularly for politicians, to actually champion any form of policy changes if there are no wins. So we need less people in the graveyard and more wins. And so actually, that's how I've kind of managed my time. So you probably see me a little bit less now and a lot more with my head down, particularly with COVID. I mean, the worst thing was that if we didn't get, if we don't come out of this, it'll be such a shame. So much effort has been put. And so, you know, we spent, we're out there really trying to ensure that as a business, we also survive, and that, that we're able to grow. So I think it's something about priorities. I mean, definitely do, 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 do engage with policymakers, but remember the priority is also to be a successful, mm -hmm. run a successful business. Didi, can I just jump in on this? Sure. So, you know, this is an issue that NGOs and like GAIN also face. Um, you know, how much of my time should I be spending running the business? Because it is a business. It's a nonprofit, but it's a business. You know, we have a PL we have to worry about. Um, and, and then how much do you do you spend championing the issues? And I, you know, I've run three organizations now, and my experience has been if you champion the issues, your your organization will always benefit. Um, maybe it wouldn't benefit as much as if you didn't champion the issues, but it it you there will be a benefit to your organization from being a champion for the issues. And it's a fine line. You have to champion the issues and not your organization. Um, Otherwise, if you champion just the organization, you lose credibility. One other thing I just wanted to quickly say is, if you're, if you're outside of the business sector and if you're not talking to businesses, business is a massive black box. So, um, I, you know, for a long time in my career, I didn't spend time talking to businesses routinely. I routinely do that for the last four or five years. And I feel like a whole vista of understanding has opened up about the challenges and the opportunities. So whatever we can do, dialogue is important. It can be a waste of time, but it can be a real uh, opening up of, of opportunities. So uh, this kind of dialogue, I think, is really important. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't like it when people say, oh, that's just a talk shop. It depends who's talking. It depends what they're saying. It depends how it's done. So dialogue between public and private engagement is really, really key. Thank you. That's a very, very valid point. And, and I'm sure that we, all of us listening in will say, okay, we have the validation that if we spend more time shaping policy, they'll be mutual, it will be mutually beneficial. And I love the point that it can't be about your own agenda. It has to be about the agenda of the broader community. Otherwise you lose credibility. We have some questions on the chat. I'll just uh, summarize them. One is asking about, uh, are there initiatives? I think it's Wetsunde. Are there initiatives in place to encourage more food processing entrepreneurs considering the limited technology and infrastructure we have in Africa? Um, and then there's another question about the fresh fruits and vegetables in, uh, landscape relative to grains and cash crops and how to um, weigh them when it comes to nutrition interventions, um, capital requirements, infrastructure development, et cetera. So I don't know who wants to jump in to either of those questions. <laughs> Maybe Monica, you could go first. Yeah, so I want to say the, the, the first question about infrastructure, I mean, definitely there's need for more uh, support, um, TA around innovation, formulation, um, as I said, food and, uh, and safety. And I think um, organizations like the Scaling Up Business uh, Net Network, uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network, and as well as Nourishing Africa, I think this is a, a beginning and it helps uh, put, put people in touch. They are organizations that are willing to help. For instance, for Java, we have worked very closely with our partners in food, uh, food solutions who have helped us throughout our thinking process, uh, looking at costing, looking at what we really can do. So they are, and, and, and was uh, part of partially funded as well. So they are, um, you just have to really know where to find the information. And I think that's where Nourishing Africa comes in, which is very helpful because you are able then to find those um, networks from there. Um, the second question related to, I'm just trying to think. Fruits about, and vegetables versus grains and cere uh, cereals. 
So I think, Lawrence, in your survey, actually you saw a bulk of uh, the SMEs on the continent or in the network actually a focus on grains, on cereals. So perhaps it's something, it's something that, uh, for instance, in Africa, people are much more conversant with. We've had the background and that's why it's a lot more, you see a lot more processes or a lot more uh, activity in those areas. But we did see a second was fruits and vegetables. And I think what it is, is that we probably need a lot more TA in encouraging um, uh, growth in those sectors. But I did think I saw grains as the first, um, sort of the largest sector with about 40% of your SMEs in that, that realm. Yeah, I'm, em I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what the breakdown is on the numbers between the grains and, and fruits and vegetables. Um, they are, I know the team is doing more work on that data. I mean, they, they just knocked it out really quickly. So I don't think they had time to do the sector disaggregations, which will be really, really interesting. That was one of the questions. I mean, one of the things I, I do think, I do think that um, the African policymakers that I have talked to in, in you know, six or seven countries, they do, there is still a mindset that we need to deal with hunger before we can deal with the quality of diet. And I have, I have a lot of sympathy for that because, you know, hunger is, is still a massive problem. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, that's a very political issue as well, isn't it? You know, people are hungry. They're gonna. They're gonna not. If they have the chance to vote, they're not gonna vote for that politician that's presided over an increase in hunger. And uh, so, sort of the quality of diet and nourishing people that doesn't have as much political uh, clout. And we need to. We need to increase the political clout of that by targeting key um, lawmakers. I think that's really. Parliaments are really important as well as as governments. Um, but. Um, on, on opportunities for um, one of the questions was uh, how do we how do we help processes and innovation within the processing space? You know, we, we're spending quite a bit of time trying to convince uh, regular mechanisms. So we're working with the African Development Bank. We're trying to get we're trying to say to the African Development Bank, you are going to put out hundreds of millions of of loans to governments uh, over the next uh, two years. How many of that is going to go? What? How much of that is going to go into the food and ag, especially the nutritious food and ag sector? So we're working with them to try to direct more of that um, to nutritious food uh, uh, and ag and, and ag sectors. But they can they're filtered by what the government decides, right? They can't that they're lending to the government, so the governments have to be the ones who change their mind. But there are there are mechanisms that governments use. Like uh, there's one called GAFSB. I'm sure you know, I forget what it stands for, but it's a big financing mechanism for food and agriculture, but it's not necessarily geared to domestic consumption. It could be for export and exports are important because they generate livelihoods and jobs and taxes. But if you want to improve the nutrition of your domestic population as directly as possible, that's not necessarily the way to go. They're also geared at, um, at non-food crops which are also important, but so it, it, you're having to convince lots of different people uh, that nutritious food matters politically, and then you can begin to gear lots of other things towards it. Um, organization by organization, government by government, facility by facility. So that's, that's the challenge. It's to convince people that um, nutritious food is not just a nice to have, it's, it's an essential component of sustainable development. I, I do think, Lawrence, I mean, coming out of COVID, that I think people, there was a general fear that if there was not enough food, I mean, whether you're in Kenya, in South Africa, Nigeria, if the people do not have access to food, you are going to have a very unruly situation. And I think that is the one thing we really need to really capitalize on to make um, people, the policymakers, uh, governments really sit up and say, okay, so how can we address this so we don't get uh, caught in another crisis of this nature? That, and, the, and the answer again is really local food systems, really yeah. in uh, building much more resilient local food systems. Yeah. Because we've seen it, I mean, I, I saw a documentary on Kenya and that was the biggest fear that people who are under lockdown could not get access to food. And that created a, a really unstable situation. But we really need to be speaking to, as you say, champions within government who are, are, are brave enough, have courage enough to act 
on food uh, to do something on, in the food sector, as opposed to building bridges, which you know, you know, you're really fighting, competing with that infrastructure developmental project. <laughs> you know, it's it is very yeah. difficult. But this is the time. This is the time. We need to find we need to find Ndidi's and Monica's in government. We need to find your equivalents in government, and then you begin to form those those alliances that really make change happen. Uh, so one of the one of the uh, thank you Lawrence and and Monica might have a better chance of getting into government soon. Than I doubt it. I don't think they want me. <laughs> but but what, one of the things that keeps me up at night, I mean, it's a comment that has come in, is really the the prioritization between food and cash crops. And I think Lawrence, you alluded to, you know, it's good to export. We get ex 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 revenue, um, and many of our countries. When we started, many of our companies, ninety percent of the processed food consumed in our country. Um, is important and yet we can actually become more efficient uh, if we invest in these value chains. Um, so two, two questions and then uh, as you're answering them please make your uh, closing remarks because we're almost out of time. One question is um, Brazil introduced a policy which is insisted on 30% local sourcing um, for every single multinational, every single company and they actually ended up with closer to 50 to 60% local sourcing in reality. Is this a viable policy that we can push in many of our other countries? And have you seen this work in any African country? So that's the first question. And then the second question is really around the investment in processing, especially around fruits and vegetables. We've seen a lot more investment, um, both from a tech perspective, financing perspective for our greens and cereals. They're obviously easier. They have a longer uh, shelf life, et cetera. Um, are there any success stories or companies that are doing this or, or stakeholders that are focused on this that we can learn from? And if not, what can we do collectively or individually to address this challenge? So I'm throwing those two out and then also asking you as you respond to please make your closing remarks. Monica, do you want to start? I'll start with the first question um, and I'll leave the other one for Lauren. That one's a little bit more detailed. I think the, the great thing about Brazil is the focus they've had on agriculture. They have amazing infrastructure. I mean, if you speak to, they say, um, it, the, 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 the billionaire in Brazil is the farmer, right? So the one thing Brazil got right is they built a very uh, resilient, a very uh, well-funded agricultural base. And therefore it made sense that you had a 30% local sourcing because it would work. So in countries such as my own, if you had 30% local sourcing, you probably would struggle to fill up that 30%. So you have to start uh, backwards. You have to build the foundation and the base first. I mean, you probably could do it simultaneously, but you couldn't do it without having the basis in which you could then source. Because if you do not build um, the, local, uh, the local businesses or the companies, then you will have nowhere to source and you'll then have these sort of subcontracting to a foreign entity, et cetera. So the one thing Brazil has done well is actually to build and actually to fund uh, their agriculture very well. Um, I think on that set, uh, the only thing I want to close on in Didi is for us to really walk away with uh, from here, really, really focusing on building local local food um, systems coming out of this crisis that we really need to focus and we agree we can't do everything. There's some countries who will do better than others in certain foods, but let's focus, you know, prioritize where you have um, comparative strengths focus on building capacity in those, uh, give them the right incentives, and then create uh, linkages. I think that's really important. Thank you. Um, thanks, Monica. And, and Didi, the questions. I'm a big believer in um, public-private engagement. So I'm a big believer in the public sector. If it wants businesses to do X, Y, and Z, it has to incentivize them to do that. Because businesses are going to go where the commercial returns are. I mean, uh, that's that's the nature of business. They they're going to stick within the laws. They're going to they're going to try to do good, but ultimately, if they can't become commercially sustainable, they will do no good to anybody. So, if you so, I, I'm a big believer in in the public sector being much more activist. So the Brazil example is a good one, because it, they said this percent has to be locally sourced. So that's that's the stick. But they also said here are a few carrots. To, to, to make that easier. In, in return for what you're going to do, we're going to do X, Y, and Z and make it slightly easier. And I, that's the model I like to see. So I would like to see, when, I, when we talk about fruits and vegetables, this is the absolute no brainer in the room when it comes to all, all the nutritionists say, whether it's diabetes, or obesity, or stunting, or wasting, whether it's anemia, we need more fruits and vegetables. 
right? So that's a massive commercial opportunity, but, and the prices are high for fruits and vegetables if you look at the prices and they're increasing relative to cereals, but there's no supply response and there's no supply response because the private sector and businesses don't have the right infrastructure, they don't have the right incentives, they don't have the right financing. So, you know, governments should be saying to their own fruits and vegetable folks, um, we're gonna support you to uh, achieve these business returns. And, and if they have to be overseas in the first place, that's okay. Because I would say, we will support you to, to, to tap into these export markets. We will do that, we'll de-risk that for you, but you have to do X, Y, and Z for the local markets as well. Uh, and I don't think that's a big ask because there'll be testing that's relevant for local markets, there'll be standards, there'll be infrastructure that's relevant for local markets, there'll be cold chains that are relevant for local markets. So I think the future is, is public-private engagement. The public sector de-risking opportunities for the private sector uh, with a few sticks and a few carrots. That, and that only happens with, with dialogue because you don't understand the risks and you don't understand the opportunities unless you act. My final point in DD is that the public sector can do a lot to talk, to walk its own talk. So public procurement of food is massive in most countries. And public procurement of food tends to still be cereals, roots, and tubers. And until the public sector starts you know, becoming a, a, a buyer of fruits and vegetables, domestically produced fruits and vegetables, it's really hard to exhort companies to do, to do something similar. So I think there, my, 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 I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think there are tons of policy levers that need to be pulled. I think most policymakers, A, don't know there's a problem, B, don't know which levers to pull, and C, some of them do know which levers to pull, and they do know there's a problem, but it's too politically inconvenient for them to do it. So we've got to work on all, all three of those types of policymakers, and I think collective voice for business in a way that's, that's not seen to be lobbying just for business. It needs to be lobbying for nutritious foods. And I think if you can do that, then we've got something. Fantastic, fantastic. Monica, you wanted to say something? No, I said, well said. Thanks, Lawrence, yes. <laughs> I completely agree. And I think that's a very positive note to end. I think all of us listening in are empowered to be change agents, to be change agents through the way we run our businesses, through the products we offer, the services we offer in the food and agriculture landscape. I believe the entrepreneurs in this landscape are heroes. They're heroes in COVID-19, they're heroes right now. And we need all of you to work collaboratively. We need public-private partnerships. We need innovative solutions. We need advocates in suits. We need advocates with, hope, uh, with tractors to get out there and ensure that we create an ecosystem that works for all Africans. So thank you again for joining us. Please, please visit nourishingafrica.com. Please visit the Scaling Up Nutrition Network. There's so many services and support uh, programs out there for you. And this is a good time to leverage them. On behalf of the team, I want to thank Monica for her excellent remarks today and thank Lawrence for an excellent presentation and very inspiring and insightful remarks. I want to thank the Catalyst team and the Nourishing Africa team that helped put this together. This will be recorded. We had about 300 people sign up. So because of the morning and I think some of the challenges, uh, we'll send it to everybody who registered because I think this is such a powerful uh, discussion and we don't want anybody else to miss it. So I thank you again and I wish you all a fantastic day. God bless you all. Thanks, thank you everybody. indeed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. 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 Thank you.